I'll start with uh, motivation because um, the reason we're doing this research is because we think that research that is publicly funded should in some way benefit society in the long run. So not immediately necessarily, but somehow it should make society better. We're not going to defend that in any way, it's just what we're assuming. Um, so just to be clear about that, and once you assume that, I think our question follows quite naturally. Namely, um, is it actually the case that in the humanities what we are doing is societally relevant? Um, and the reason we're investigating it is that there are quite a few people who have raised doubts about this. Um, quite a few prominent people, so Kitcher is one of them. Um, he describes a lot of contemporary philosophy as scholastic self-indulgence for a few. Dennett also has a nice one. He thinks that many projects in contemporary philosophy are artifactual puzzles of no abiding significance. And then Lindsay and Bogosian, if that's how you pronounce his name, um, just because the quote is nice, they think that philosophy twiddles away and seriously entertains the hybrid, esoteric, and inconsequential. To attend the philosophy conference is to marvel at the obscurity and irrelevance of what's become of the discipline. So those are pretty damning words, I mean, they're a bit strong here and there, um, but they do raise a legitimate question, I think. The problem is that it's not very easy to measure societal relevance, so to check whether research is societally relevant. There's the easy way to go, which is to use hot metrics. Um, there's lots of data available, it's very easy to gather and to analyze. The um, problem is that we don't really know what it means. It's probably not very reliable. So number of Facebook likes or tweets or Google Plus mentions that really exist. Um, they, they probably say very little about societal relevance. And so that's not the best way to go. Um, sorry. So a better way to go is to do in-depth analysis of research projects. Just really look at what they did, how it impacted society which probably works great but isn't scalable like we want to look at this at a large scale and then that's just not feasible so the way that most people go by necessity I mean funding agencies or institutions is they just ask other researchers to read a summary of the project um, and then decide whether it's society involved so they use peer review and that's what we've investigated in this research project uh, use of peer review for measuring So these are research questions. To what extent is research in humanity societally relevant? We just want to try to give a very rough answer to that question. Um, are there differences between subfields in the humanities? And I find the ease peer review will be useful to for this. So this is the structure of the talk. Um, I'll first very briefly say something about this notion of societal relevance. Um, then I'll talk about our methods and I'll end with uh, the results and discussion. So first, this notion of societal relevance. Um, I just want to start with a disclaimer because I don't want to make anyone angry. That we, we don't claim that relevance is the same as value. So I'm assuming that most, if not all, research in the humanities is somehow valuable. If it's going to be interesting or thought-provoking or it's going to make the researcher who does it happy. Um, maybe not your thesis, <laughs> 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 but most. Um, but that's not what we mean by societal relevance. Um, so it, there has to be more limited because some of the things that are clearly valuable aren't relevant to our society. Um, and a productive way for thinking about this is to uh, go via research funding. So we'll just be assuming that. Society relevant is just whatever is worth funding given the funds that we have. And you get some kind of a relative notion of, of relevance where you try to rank the projects and whatever is above the funding line is societally relevant. Um, that's still very vague, it doesn't give us very much to go by, but it gives us something. We can use Kitcher's ideas about an ideal committee and this idea of well-ordered science, I assume. Most of you will have heard about it. 
so just very briefly, it's a thought experiment by Kitcher uh, that he proposes to uh, evaluate the research agenda of science. So, um, is science actually investigating what it should investigate? And what should it investigate, according to Kitcher, we should investigate whatever would be chosen by an ideal committee. So it's just a thought experiment, it's not a real committee. It's a way of thinking about what we should be doing. And this ideal committee, it um, should consist of well-informed deliberators, so they know what they're talking about, what they're evaluating. Um, they should perfectly represent all segments of society, not just one country, anything, but all of humanity now and in the future, so all interests should be represented. And um, they should also be charitable, so try to understand each other, try to take each other's preferences into account, and whatever they would choose is what is society relevant. Um, there's of course lots of problems with um, this thought experiment. It's probably underdetermined what they would choose. Um, if it weren't, it's probably impossible to know what they would choose. Um, but we do think that it gives us something to go by, namely the intuition that what is societally relevant is somehow related to this democratic decision of all of society. So whatever we choose, it should be something that, in some sense, the majority would choose. So that's what we've used um, to reformulate our research questions. The first research question then becomes, to what extent are scholars in humanities currently investigating what the ideal committee would choose? Second research question is still about differences between the fields in that sense. And then finally, should we expect peer reviewers to select the research that an ideal committee would select? So those are the questions. Um, the way we've investigated this is we've hired expert raters to read a bunch of abstracts and evaluate whether they think they would be chosen by an ideal committee. I'll explain this. Uh, further later, um, just do all the clicks now. Um, we made them read 690 abstracts from Web of Science, um, both journal papers and books. We selected more books than their true proportion in the, in the database because we think a lot of the slightly relevant work might be in the books and we, we definitely wanted to capture that. Um, time window is for these four years, that's not really relevant for this study, but we have an altmetric study paired to it, and um, that's relevant there. So the fields we divided the humanities into are history, philosophy, religion, linguistics, and literature. This is just taken from the ECOM classification. Uh, ECOM is sort of the Flemish institution that deals with research evaluation. Um, with some small changes, like we dropped arts and design because Almost all of their publications are in just normal journals, so it's very difficult to compare to the other fields. And architecture we dropped as well, because a lot of architecture is just engineering work, and that's just not typical humanities. So part of it is typical humanities, but then it would be very difficult to select uh, only those papers. Um, and then we hired 16 people who were either doing a PhD or had already gotten their PhD, at least two from each field, and we briefed them in advance extensively about um, Kitcher's ideas and the tasks we wanted them to do. And then we divided the abstracts into two sets, because even half of all abstracts already took like 10 hours, and we thought 20 hours of waiting would be, would be a bit too much. So that's a general overview. The rating task we gave them is we gave them 69 sets of five abstracts, and each set had uh, one abstract from each field, just randomly selected. And they got those five abstracts on their screen simultaneously, and then we asked them first to order the abstracts uh, by how likely they think it would be that they would be chosen by the ideal committee. So they would just get a rank from one to five with the most valuable one at the top. And then we also asked them for each uh, separate abstract 
uh, to also indicate whether they think it's likely that the committee would choose it, so that we also had some kind of absolute measure. So it might be that all five abstracts from that set are ones or zeros. Um, that, that was up to the raters, or some ones and some zeros. The only restriction we gave them was that the two ratings had to be somehow coherent. So if one abstract was ranked above another uh, in the ranking measure, then it couldn't be that the lower ranked one had a one and the higher ranked one had a zero. So those were the tasks. Um, that for the analysis of the data, I'll say a bit more about this because that's where our assumptions really come out very clearly and I think those are the ones that are important to think about and get some feedback on. Um, so we, we wrote a generative model of the data, so a model that sort of mimics how we think the data uh, was generated. And the, the main assumption sort of, of this model was that when raters do the tasks, the ranking tasks and the binary task, they um, put the abstracts on some sort of an implicit continuous scale of relevance. So we assume that the raters think of societal relevance as something continuous. And abstracts are more or less um, relevant, and this is a latent, a latent variable we can measure. Um, and we're assuming that this latent relevance estimate of the raters, that it somehow depends on the content and form of the abstract, so the reason they give it a a higher or lower estimate we think is because the abstract is about certain things or has a certain form. Uh, but we also think that the estimate depends on certain characteristics of the raters themselves. So they might have certain biases. Um, for example, we think they might be chauvinistic and that they might rate abstracts from their own fields differently from abstracts from other fields. And so from those um, assumptions follows that the ordinal outcome okay, um, we will assume that it's simply a ranking of the estimated relevance scores for each of the abstracts so they get this set of five papers they will implicitly put those five papers on a relevance scale a continuous scale and then whichever one has the highest score just is the top one and so on the binary score is a bit more complicated. It's, we think it's clearly um, influenced by this relevance estimate, so the probability of getting a 1 is higher if the relevance estimate is higher. Uh, but in addition to that, we think it's also dependent on the strictness of a rater. So there might be some raters that are very strict, and even if they have the same relevance estimate as another rater, they might not give a 1, and the other rater might give a 1. So the binary score is determined both by the relevance estimate and by the strictness of the meters. So that's just verbally a uh, summary of our assumptions. Uh, we've also put this in a directed asymmetry graph, which is a representation of the causal relations of our variables. And the outcome variables are this binary data and this rank data. As I've mentioned, the, they are both influenced by the estimate that the rater makes of the relevance of the abstract. Um, but in addition to that, the binary data is also influenced by the strictness. The estimate, in turn, is influenced by two things as well. In the first place, by some latent true value of the paper. And we don't want to be too metaphysically committal about this. Um, we can think of it like IQ in the context of intelligence, so it's, it's just a construct that we use of, um, well, to, to model how this, uh, how this estimate comes to be. So we think that the estimate of the raters will not be the same as this true relevance of the paper, but it will be somehow similar to it. It will be influenced by it. In and in addition to that, also by it. The biases, the true relevance of the paper in turn um, is influenced by a whole bunch of things. Um, these are um, codes, so that indicates, they're all binary codes that indicate whether the content of the paper has a certain feature. So whether it is about ethics or morality, whether it is about the present, whether it is about um, the representation and 
discrimination against minorities, that's this intolerance, whether the abstract describes empirical research, whether the abstract or the research described in the abstract has impact on education, on health and well-being, um, whether the abstract deals with physical sciences or the physical environment. And then the final two are um, document type, whether the abstract was a book or an abstract, a uh, book or a paper. And the field rest is just sort of an intercept that indicates what field the paper came from and that captures sort of everything that's not captured by other codes. The way we got data for this is we made a coding scheme um, and then two of us read all the abstracts and coded them for these things and then we compared the results and discussed any disagreements until we had a consensus coding. Um, and so we are assuming that these things influence the true relevance of the abstract, which in turn influences the estimate of the raters, which then, together with these other factors, uh, generates the data that we actually have, the binary and the ordinal data. Um, so then we've turned that into a statistical model, so this Bayesian model, which basically has the same structure as the, the DAG that I just described. So there's this, uh, I don't have a pointer, but there's the, the binary rating and the rank data. Binary rating is caused by the relevance estimate and by the strictness of the raters. The relevance estimate in turn is caused by the true relevance and by the chauvinism. Um, so that's the same structure. There's a couple of features that I should probably explain because there are additional assumptions. Firstly, the structure of the model is hierarchical. So we're assuming that the data has a hierarchical structure. There are certain groups in the, in the data and that it's relevant to tell the model about uh, the fact that these groups exist. So more precisely, we have these uh, rater estimates of the abstracts and we're sort of telling the model that all the estimates of the same paper are somehow in the same group and what that allows us to do is we can pull the information between those uh, estimates of the same paper um, to sort of all mutually inform them so imagine there's nine ratings of the same abstract in total because we have nine raters for one group then if eight of those ratings were pretty high and the ninth one was very low then the model is going to pull that nine, ninth one more towards the mean because we've given them the same prior they're sort of and through this prior they're pulling information um, so that's a very nice feature i think because we can really get all of everything out of the data that we possibly can because we're telling the model that they're probably related but it's also an assumption we're making we're giving them the same prior. And we do the same thing on the level of the true relevance of papers on the field. So we're telling the model that we're pulling information basically between all the papers from the same field. They share a prior, so every paper of that field will update that prior, which will go into all the other papers of that field, and that way all the papers sort of inform each other. Um, that's very nice because we can pull information, but we also get out of our model an estimate of the mean relevance of each field and the standard deviation as well. Um, but it's again an assumption that we have to be very clear about because it's, we're sort of putting into the model that these are groups. And then the final thing that I should clarify because it's not so typical for Bayesian models to do this is um, that sort of this part is the generative model. That's how we think the data is generated. It's sort of tagged on to that. We have a, just a classical linear regression um, with all the causal factors put into the regression. And the observed outcome variable is this estimated uh, true relevance. So we're using this estimated true relevance of our papers to run a linear regression that has the causes um, going into it. The nice thing about that is that we keep the uncertainty that we have there about the true relevance of those papers and put it into this regression. So we are, like the alternative was to use means or something like that, but then we lose the uncertainty. And this way we can 
sort of propagates the uncertainty all the way through the model, also for the causes. So, it, so is that more or less clear? Because I'm very bad at explaining this. I, I personally don't understand it, basically. Uh, but I'm sorry. I don't know if you could repeat what the aim of the model is again. So the the aim of the model is just to sort of mimic how we think our data was generated. So we have our data, and somehow this was produced by these curators. And what we're trying to do here is to get a mathematical formulation of that of that process of generating the data. Uh, okay. So that's what this model does. And okay, okay. To understand the reason behind the decisions that the readers did? Um, to, to see how important various factors are. So right. we, we tell the model this is how it was generated, and then assuming that it was generated this way and we have these data, well, how important was strictness, how important was chauvinism, how important was that the paper was from ethics, and so on. Right. So, Assuming that the data was actually generated like that, our model will tell us how important these things were. This is probably a good time to ask. I was going to ask this question at the end, but it's probably a good time to do it now. Can chauvinism take negative one? Um, so I've, I've given it a... Well, I've actually ran two models, one with just one chauvinism parameter for all raters. Um, and I've given it a normal prior with uh, a mean of zero, so it okay. can okay. go either way. Yeah. Um, and then I've also ran a model with varying chauvinism parameters, so each rate had their own chauvinism parameter. And there we saw that most were positive, obviously, but there were some strongly negative ones as well. So that's, yeah, that's yeah, because it's it's oddly in my in my the the place that the place where I've done something like this before in in uh, circumstances like co-taught classes, we've often noted that people tend to be. You notice the flaws in the stuff that's about your own field, right? right. Yeah, I, uh, I was thinking about which that. feels kind of like negative chauvinism, mm -hmm. right? Or it might reflect as yeah, they, they have expertise, so they might just be able to judge it. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So yeah, definitely. Um, but, uh, cool, but the model, yeah, cool. You're good. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> okay, so then the results. Maybe first something about the scale. I haven't said anything about this, but we are working with basically three levels of latent variables. So there is this estimate, there is the paper relevance, and there is the field relevance. And none of these are on a real scale that we know of, or that is natural. It's sort of the model that determines the scale on the basis of the, the ones and zeros it got for the binary ratings. Uh, you might have seen I've put a logic, logic link into the model here, um, which sort of determines that our scale will be somewhere between, say, minus 4 and plus 4, because that's where you are at, like, almost 0 and almost 1. Um, but just to give you an idea of this scale, I've checked which papers are the, sort of, got the lowest score and the highest score, and the mean scores, so you have an idea that the value goes from this to this. So, sorry, so uh, on, on, on this scale you have the binary scale Final calculation of sorts? These, these are the, the estimated, so this, I should have said, this is a density plot, so sort of a histogram of right. the mean estimated true paper relevances. So our okay. model gives each paper a certain value, and that's its value. I'm just saying the scale is from about minus 4 to plus 4. And just to anchor this scale to tell you what minus 4 means and what plus 4 means, I've checked which papers actually got those scores. Okay. So this was the paper that got the lowest estimated score. I think it is from. Should I move this yeah. aside? <coughs> so I think it is from religion or from history. Um, it basically discusses how two, I think, rather obscure texts are related. It might explain why it got low scores. Probably none of the readers knew these texts. <coughs> then the. Yeah, it also scored zero for all our codes, of course. Then the mean one was also from religion, um, but it at least points to the discussion of enduring difficult questions, which might well be society relevant. And it might foster more reflection, so it scored one for the ethics code. Um, mm -hmm. And then finally, the one that got the highest score was one about language impairment children from linguistics, easy to understand why it gets a high score. 
it also uh, had an empirical component so it scored one for these three for these three groups. Yeah, I've done the same for philosophy because I thought there would be a lot of scores. Um, I haven't checked for history, but this is the philosophy one. So the lowest one was a purely historical paper about Philip Frank. I don't know if you've ever heard about him. You have? No, well, I I I have never heard of him. He did the Library of Living Philosophers series, right? I think. Late, kind of an arch positivist, if I remember right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no causal goods in any way. The, the mean one was one about Kierkegaard. Also, no causal goods, but it does discuss something about dealing with anxiety um, and what we can do. So maybe that prompted Raters to give it a higher score. And then the one with the highest score is a very illustrative one, I think. It uh, is about education and the responsible conduct of research, which is a rather societally relevant topic. Um, it explains why it is important. It says there is a problem that we have to solve, and then it says we solved it. So <laughs> it, it very literally does something that they claim to decide. So that's the scale. And so all the results I'll be presenting will be somewhere on this scale. <coughs> so first, the uh, rater scores. So 36% of the ratings we got were a one. Um, you can see there is some variation in um, between fields. The inter-rater reliability for those uh, scores was very low. Probably not very surprisingly. Uh, it was better than chance. So it's not like it was completely random, but it really wasn't very high. So there was enormous disagreement between raters. Uh, it was a bit better for the rank data. Still not very good, so that you would say fair. And you sort of see the same patterns coming back in the rank data and in the primary data. <coughs> um, so inter-rater reliability was very low. Our raters disagreed a lot. One of the things that might have caused this is chauvinism, we think. Well, These the are linguistics just people really hate literature. Yeah, yeah, so... So that's something we, we didn't put in our model because we didn't expect this, but there are some special relations between fields. Like some fields just, just dislike each other, and <laughs> some fields are fine with each other. Um, but so yeah, you can also see that PhDs from history and philosophy gave their own fields rather high scores, so probably there is some chauvinism going on somewhere. That's also what our model tells us. This is for the model with a single chauvinism parameter, uh, which on a scale from minus 4 to 4 is quite substantial. Um, but there was quite a big difference between group 1 and group 2, so we had this group of 7 raters and 9 raters, and they had different abstracts, but still very different, so that's why I tried a model with a varying chauvinism parameter, and there you can see that the differences are really big, right? We go from minus 2 to plus 2, and in particular people from linguistics are not very chauvinistic, they get zero, they get negative scores, um, and people from philosophy were quite chauvinistic. I mean, most people were a bit chauvinistic in a positive sense. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, I think, an interesting finding. <coughs> then the other way to explain the, the massive disagreement that we have in our model is rate strictness. So people varied massively in how many ones and how many zeros we gave them. Even though they got exactly the same instructions, so there was there were very big differences in rate strictness, and that's reflected uh, when we just sum the, the the binary scores per paper. So for group one there were nine raters, for group two seven. So each paper can have at most nine or seven. And you can see that except for the maximum score, the whole spectrum is pretty well populated. So there was a lot of disagreement and very little complete agreement. And that's also what our model tells us. There were very big differences in rate of strictness. So this is both for the model that varies chauvinism and that keeps chauvinism fixed. Um, 
Um, so again, it goes to minus one and a half and up to plus one. So very big differences. Um, then for the differences between fields, um, these are the mean, these are density plots. So again, histograms basically of the mean estimated paper values per field. And they show a pattern that's pretty consistent throughout our data. Uh, philosophy and linguistics have slightly higher means. Uh, literature clearly lower and religion and history together somewhere below that. Um, I should say that if for the model with a fixed chauvinism parameter, the differences are bigger. It's the same pattern, but bigger differences. But I think this is a more conservative estimate. Um, and it's reflected in the estimates that our model gives us of the field means and the field standard deviations. At the risk of saying something really that, that, that could be interpreted extremely provocatively, the philosophy curve looks a lot like the sum of two normal distributions. Yeah, I mean... Have you, have you played with that idea? No, I haven't. I haven't okay. played it. But mm -hmm. it's, I mean, <laughs> either, either way it is... You fill in your own interpretation of what I could mean when I say that. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's, it's web of science, so it's, it's limited. Yeah, true. It's only in English. But true. It, it, but either way, you can see that the extremes go. I mean, it's a standard deviation of philosophy, as you can see here. Huge. It's very high. Yeah. And it fits with my experience of philosophy, where well, you'll have ethics papers about something very relevant, and then you'll have some extremely obscure history of metaphysics, or I don't know what for which it's very hard to see how it will be society around or whatever. And history, on the other hand, the standard deviation is rather low, and to me it makes sense, because they're all talking about the past, probably nothing super important, but it's also all... It's, it's, there's something in these standard deviations that's more interesting than the, than the differences between the fields. Mm -hmm. So if we use these hyperparameters, the estimated field mean and standard deviation to draw posterior predictive samples from the data. So what you do is you take a random mean, uh, not really random proportionally to how much of them, how likely it is in the posterior distribution. And you take a random standard deviation by how likely it is on the posterior. And then you take, I think it's 10,000 samples I've taken here. You sort of get an estimate of what, given our evidence, we can expect to believe about the distribution of value in the various fields. And this incorporates both the uncertainty about our estimates, um, like we have these parameter uncertainties, we have like, a mean and some region around it, and that's where we, where we think value might be. So there's that uncertainty, but there's also the uncertainty of just sampling from a field now and again, you'll sample an extremely valuable or an extremely invaluable paper. So these posterior predictive samples, they, they sort of take together these two kinds of uncertainty and we present them at the same time. So I think that's the most, the most, uh, the most fair representation of the, of the various fields, so what we can believe about them. And so it's the same pattern, basically, uh, just a bit more spread out uh, and with very small differences. So clearly the differences between fields exist, um, but they are much smaller than what the greater features. So then finally, what influences the rater estimates? These were the, the causal factors. Um, all our codes get picked up by the model as seeming to increase the probability in the end of getting a 1 in the binary score or getting a high rank. Except for document type, we thought that maybe book abstracts are written in a more commercial way, which we had to take them from Amazon, I think, because mm -hmm. Web of Science didn't always have abstracts, and so we were a bit afraid that these will be written as abstracts to sell books and um, we will see this in data, but so that wasn't the case. But other than that, um, the minority groups has a very strong effect ethics also, also there was, although there was some difference between the groups, um, health and well-being, 
being able to present also very important. And then that linear regression also had a intercept for the fields. Um, and it sort of captures any variation that is by field but is not captured by these other codes. Um, and there you can see that it's really small. So here the absolute values don't mean anything because it's an intercept and there's no like natural zero or anything. So what's really relevant is the difference between them. I should have actually just plotted the difference, but basically the differences are very small and there's probably a lot of overlap. So there is there are things we're not capturing clearly, like literature is clearly lower than the rest, so there must be something about literature that we don't know about, but that makes it less relevant than the rest. Uh, but it's it's not very strong. Okay. So then just very briefly the discussion, I'll just briefly come back to the um, research questions. So firstly, to what extent is research in humanity society relevant? Well, 36% of the abstracts got a 1, the rest got a 0. Uh, our model suggests that due to chauvinism, maybe this 36% overestimates what we should um, expect to see if chauvinism uh, wasn't a problem. And I should also say that we, we ran a pilot of the same study in a few classes of science students. Um, they were just master students and they got fewer sets, but there we basically got almost no ones. So it might be that there is just a humanities bias in our set of raters. Uh, which is very tricky because on the one hand we want people who are well informed, who understand all the abstracts. Um, but on the other hand, as soon as you are well informed, well you're probably going to be a bit biased because you've committed to a career in the humanities, so you probably find it important, more important than the average, uh, the average person. The people we used in the science classes, they were still more or less in the same group, but if you would ask you know, people in South Africa or people 3,000 years from now will be even way more different. So there's definitely bias in our raters, and it might like inflate the value even more so. And this is a very rough measure, but I think it is some indication that uh, probably a lot of the research that we're doing in the humanities is not research that will be chosen by the ideal committee. So that's something to think about. Uh, what to do? Well, I should say again, to make, uh, do not make anyone angry, I really believe this. I, I don't think this is a problem on the individual level. Uh, I think it's really a problem of the incentive structure. Like academia is structured in such a way that we have to write certain kinds of papers in certain kinds of journals, and or that often makes it way easier to get papers published if they are of a certain kind. And it's often, well, it's often much harder to do societally relevant research and have a successful career as an academic. So I think the main thing that should be done is to just change the incentive structure and make this thing that is mostly rewarded, not just publications in specialized journals, but some kind of impact. Uh, that being said, there's one thing that I always say when I talk about this, um, and that is when I like, chose the topic for my PhD and throughout my PhD and even after that, I've got lots of advice from people on how to be strategic if I want a successful academic career, like write this kind of paper, choose this kind of topic, and deal with the reviewers like this and so on. But I simply never, no one ever told me, look, why don't you try to choose as a research topic something that is really a societal problem and try to solve it. I'm not saying this cannot be combined, maybe you can be both strategic and solve a societal problem, I think it's often the case, like choose a topic that the world really needs to be solved and maybe the chance of getting money is higher, but it's just advice that I got very rarely, so I think a small difference would already, could already be made if all the supervisors encourage their own students to find something that really needs to be done and do it and even if you don't have a career in academia at least you will have turned this societal funding into something something useful. <coughs> and 
at the differences between the fields. So as I said, very small differences in estimated mean. A lot of overlap. Literature seems to be a bit lower. Linguistics and philosophy a bit higher. Um, but yeah, limited number of readers, all from K Web Arts faculty. <coughs> There's dynamics in the model, in the data that we've definitely not captured, like the, the weird relation between philosophy and literature or linguistics and literature. So that's something we have to look into. So we'll probably want to replicate, try to replicate this with more diverse creators and see if the, the same results come back. But I think we'll always struggle with this trade-off between expertise and bias, so I really don't know how to, how to control for that or how to deal with that. And finally, where I think our results are most important <coughs> is in the, the question whether peer review is a useful tool for measuring societal relevance. So our results tell us that um, even though peer review is used very widely, like basically any grant application will have a criteria of societal relevance, you will have some question about it, you'll have to write a paragraph about what your impact will be. Um, but what it looks like is that the individual rater features uh, probably outweigh any differences in value between fields or papers that we, uh, that we are looking at. It's of course not a massive surprise, like there's a lot of literature about peer reviewing grant funding in general and iterated reliability is very often zero there. Look at the, the top 80% of paper of grants at least. So there is there just is a lot of noise. It. So it's the same for societal relevance probably, and it just shows that it is a massive problem. So I think this, this needs more research. Uh, firstly, the chauvinism. So there's the question whether it is some sort of a bias in favor of your own field, like you've chosen your field, so you like it more, so you think it's more important, so you're going to give it more money. But it could also be that you just understand it better and uh, so you can see the real value or you see, see the real problems. And there's also the question how it works precisely. So now we have people from different fields evaluating uh, papers from different fields which mimics an interdisciplinary panel or maybe uh, an institutional panel. Uh, but there's similar questions within a field, like where you rate your own specialization higher or lower, your own fields, neighboring fields, faraway fields. I think these are all measurable things that are quite important because they are such committees are used everywhere and we're basically assuming these things don't happen so they should be, they should be investigated. And uh, similar to the chauvinism, there was a lot of variation in what counts as sufficiently societally relevant to be funded. So one question this raises is, are academics actually capable of uh, evaluating societal relevance? So we are just assuming, well, we ask them to review the scientific quality of the proposal. They're probably not capable of doing that. That's what the research suggests, as in, there's zero integrated reliability, but it's sort of reasonable to think they could. But it's not clear that it's also reasonable to think they are good at evaluating whether a proposal is important to society. Mm -hmm. so there's a lot of other people that might be better at evaluating that, policy makers or just people from the public. There are some um, funding systems that already use non academic reviewers. Um, in the process just for the societal relevance. Um, I don't think any empirical research has been done on that. But that's definitely something that should be should be considered. Like should we just assume that academics are good at evaluating whether something is societally important? Because they are going to be biased. Like if you're a philosopher you might just be happy to say, well give this philosophy project more money, it needs to be done. Um, it is very important. And so this I think it's important to check for this bias. And so finally, I think it would be 
nice defenders didn't just assume that all these biases and uncertainty don't exist. So that's what they do now. They just ask the people to review and then they have some sort of more or less random way of aggregating these judgments. Either they sum the review scores in some way or they just have a committee meeting and then in the end there is someone who decides what's decided by consensus. Well, all these factors, they can be modeled, they can be investigated, so why not use statistical models to evaluate your grants and try to model these factors? And I think that would already be a serious step forward. And I think, yeah, that was it. Very cool. Um, do you want to take five? Okay, cool. Yeah, alright. Questions? Uh, well, thanks. Uh, um, you are both uh, authors. Oh, oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, the first thing, I mean, I have a lot of questions. But first, more, uh, I don't know if you saw an email I sent a few days ago about there's this open call for a seminar on open science and the possibilities for open science in. in in, uh, in the humanities and social sciences and I know some of the people who organize this in the Netherlands and I think it kind of, I don't know if you'd be interested, but it's the kind of stuff that they, they are interested in. I mean, yours is not about open science itself, but I think it, it, it could have, that could be read in the language. Um, because I think they are really interested in, in understanding what does open science uh, mean in, in, in humanities and, and social sciences. So, I suggest that maybe you check out. Yeah, right? check it out yeah. um, and so, uh, uh, so yeah. My my question mostly, um, maybe it's more a comment, but um, uh, in a way, your model seems to work, right? Because it it it, uh, it shows. Like you say that, that um, it's hard to do socially relevant research in the humanities, right? Uh, your results seem to show that, and that's not that surprising if you take into account um, what what people take into to be socially relevant research. Like you say, if it's empirical, if it's present, and, and so on. Um, but also because it sort of it, it reproduces what the funding agencies want you to, to do. It's uh, this empirically based, uh, goes to science. Uh, if you talk about health or, or something like that, it will get funded. So in a way, it doesn't. Um, it's not surprising. Um, maybe also because of the relationship between peer review and and uh, uh, and uh, social relevance as how it has been historically constructed. Um, because I coincidentally peer review and, and, and social relevant research was two things that were institutionalized in the, in the 1970s uh, precisely as a peer review as a means to to, to make sure that, that science was accountable to, to, um, to society um, so it, I, I don't know how, how can I can explain it. Uh, maybe I'm going through it, but um, that the models does seem to work because it uh, reproduces what um, the, the science that is already published uh, within the, the, the sort of the financial accountability of, of uh, funding agencies. Well, it's. It's of course a bit circular because we start from these causal assumptions, namely this is how our data is, we're telling the model this is how our data is generated, these are the causes. Of course our model can say, well, the, the, the causes are not very strong or there's, there's almost nothing happening. So our model does tell us that the causes are relevant. But it's not so surprising that our model points to these causes because we're literally telling the model these are the causes. So you always have to be very careful about this, like the, the cause structure you put in the model is also what your model will assume is just true and it will tell you the values to put on those parameters. 
assuming that this causal structure is true. But like you could see that uh, document type, for example, uh, isn't quite clear. This one seems to have like zero impact, so clearly we seem to be picking up on something. That the, the dot that is not is like sort of a yeah, control. I, yeah, I mean there is there is a big difference between say being a book or right. being about ethics. Like your having your paper about ethics really increases the chances of being of it being selected by the raters as society development. Um, but you always have to keep in mind that well the model cannot point to other causes because we haven't told the model about the existence of other causes. Right. Got well, yeah, a lot of questions, but I wanted to ask about this um, idea that you gestured to at the end because I do think this is a really a really interesting upshot of this kind of work is is to try to think about operationalizing like distance between fields as some kind of variable um, to try to get a handle on this question of. You know, bias versus expertise. So I'm thinking about what, one thing I was trying to kind of crunch on over the actually who presenting the results, especially. So, so what would the parallel study in science look like, right? And I think it's actually really interesting to think about. You know, what would a physicist think about a paper about, you know, community ecology of microarthropods in moss on a rock in the UK somewhere? Like, you know, and the physicist is going to be like, hot garbage, right? Like, and so I, 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 and, and I think, I mean, I think there is a really, for me, that's, for me, that's kind of the, the sort of, maybe the biggest elephant in the room here is trying to think about how to disentangle that kind of bias versus expertise effect that like, and this is also in part related, and this I guess, let me, because this is, now let me try to turn this into a, more, really more of a question than a comment, sorry. Um, this is a bit related to, so one, there is one kind of negative aspect of using abstracts, right? Which is that abstracts are talking to your peers, right? And so if I'm the biologist writing the microarthropod moss study, I was actually reading a microarthropod moss study this morning, that's why this example's in my head. Uh, I can, I'm writing to my friends, right? I'm writing to my colleagues. I'm writing to people who will read that and go, of course I understand why that's useful because moss communities have massive gamma diversity in their microarthropod micro communities. So actually it's a super interesting model. Um, and like my buddies know that. Um, and so I almost, there's, a, there's, an interesting, there's an interesting question here. I wonder, maybe, maybe another thing to do would be to try to repeat this with uh, grant abstracts, mm -hmm. where you're trying a little harder to talk to people who won't have any idea what the hell you're talking about. Yeah, that's a good point. The reason we, we decided to go with mostly journal paper abstracts is that the incentive structure of academia is such that we spend a lot of our time writing okay. those and that's sort of the basic currency that drives everything. So, and that's a lot of what we're doing is doing those things and well, it's true, we're not speaking to outsiders, but that also means the outsiders probably won't read it and the chances of impacting something is, is a lot lower. But it's true that it, it misses out on part of the relevance of the research content for sure. Yeah. Um, Maybe there is some, with regards to the, the comment on the, 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 the distance between the fields, maybe there was some kind of bibliometric way of making sense of these things. <coughs> I don't know. Like you, how should ask, you should ask Peshan. But yeah, like how separate are the citations? How separate yeah. are the citation so, communities? Yeah, that would be something I would think of. And, and this work on this one of the classifications is that you know this uh, is it web of science that uses these so sort the of web of science classification of, of uh, different disciplines i think they're based on 
some kind of yeah, bibliometric the, the, the clustering. Basic, the basic mm -hmm. metrics, but I, yeah, it's hard to see how, how do you think it would be, it would help here. So any, any citation kind of metrics, they're always normalized by fields. So it's very difficult to compare across fields. Yeah. Just, something, just something like, are we sometimes uh, writing in similar journals? So for instance, uh, yeah, with this journal, relations yeah, so mm -hmm. for instance, there is this journal called Linguistics and Philosophy, mm -hmm. right? Um, they reject my paper, so there's that example. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, for instance, both linguists and philosophers publish in linguistics and philosophy. Do they cite each other's paper, each other's paper, each other's papers? But the Venn diagram between us and literature is going to be way yeah. smaller. Yeah, there's like there's probably like a tiny but handful of people who do it. But I do think that the literature people still read Lacan. Maybe yeah, just putting some biases on the table here. But uh, yeah, okay, I, I don't read Lacan, but too. Uh, but well, in, in all the big classifications, the no, 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 just <laughs> it's just a single thing. So all the big classifications have a lot of fields, and humanities is just one small box on the yeah. side. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Well, it's also because I mean, of course, it's the other problem with bibliometric analyses of this sort. If you want to bridge sciences and humanities, is that our citation practices suck. Yeah. 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 Even so, humanities. Yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> it's so terrible. Yeah. Like in the FWO thing, you have to. Uh, assign some disciplines to yourself that you use the distribution of these and how often people. Yeah, it's all about having access to the data, right? The nice Start data on the, on the research portal. Well, well, like how many, like how many proposals that have a philosophy field code have a, also carry a linguistics field code? Yeah, that, that, that kind yeah. of. FNRS has the same thing. Yeah. Or, or just how often they cite papers in another field. So I can imagine the micro, the people with the mouse and the, and, and the critters citing general ecology papers. Or something. Right, uh, right, sure. And not like I'm. <laughs> yeah, not like I'm. Yeah, exactly. They're lost. <laughs> uh, I have a question related to. to, to the idea of um, looking at other things than, than abstracts is that, um, I don't know, but perhaps the humanities have a way of being socially relevant that is not through academic publications, which might, might also explain why um, the, the number of citations is not that great. So, um, of course, if, if you leave papers as a, as, a, as a source to look at, you cannot maybe run but bibliometrics, but I can imagine, for example, the person, you know, the, this very sort of localized uh, understanding of, of, of this issue, but perhaps the person working on, on religion, uh, that person is also doing, uh, maybe it's, it's, a, it's a simplistic, but um, charity work on the uh, evenings, and, and, and that is related to his or her academic work. But not necessarily um, socially relevant in the way that um, uh, that you constructed it, and so I, I'm wondering if, if those differences between the humanities and the sciences um, are hard to pick up by methods that maybe are designed to 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 assess more natural sciences than humanities uh, to begin with. It's definitely true that. Almost all the societal relevance of the humanities is not in the papers. Right. It's definitely true. Um, we have those, those in-depth qualitative analysis I was talking about. Is I think the only way of really capturing that. There's other ways like AHRC in, in the UK. All universities, all departments have to like submit case studies uh, every couple of years um, that show societal relevance. We have some, some data sets that you can use. Um, but the problem remains that the main currency in academia are these papers. Mm -hmm. As a philosopher, maybe my societal impact is not through my papers, but I do spend 90% of my time writing those papers. Mm -hmm. and so the problem might just be the fact that you're writing too many papers and not doing other stuff that we could be doing. So definitely there is. While we're, while we're doing these kind of more meta-level points, um, 
It's been years since I picked up the relevant picture here, so I forget, honestly, whether he mentioned something like this or not. But one, one way in presenting the project that might help fend off the angry response, um, one thing that you might say, and I don't, again, I don't, know, I don't know if Kitcher does say this, but one thing that you might say is, you know, the ideal, the ideal committee also might make the meta-level decision about what ratio of irrelevant work they want, right? And it's actually very plausible that that's not going to be zero, especially after you tell, explain to the committee that, like, there's been lots of weird serendipitous stuff that came as a result of basic science and crazy humanities, like sometimes that's useful um, for kind of fire reasons, right? Is um, the argument is though, like I, yes. this, is, this is the argument I always get when I give talks about this, and it makes sense for mathematics and theoretical physics maybe, which are a lot like the humanities in that it's super weird, obscure stuff, but sometimes they do something that changes the world. But for philosophy, it's really hard to think of examples of this serendipity that really work? I mean, this partly depends on what kind of time window Yeah, okay, if you, you, if want. you count Aristotle and Plato, sure. I mean, <laughs> well, I want to, but I, but I want to count Kant and I want to count the positivists because I don't think you get a lot of, I think a lot of 20th century physics doesn't make sense, except it's once you realize that all those guys were reading up on their neo-Kantian you know, understandings of space and time. And is what Kant was doing really what we're doing now as philosophers? Just no, and then I, like I said, it just depends on what you, I mean, what kind of time, what kind of time window, what kind of time window you're, you're looking at. Yeah. Um, I'm thinking about the current sort of paper producing industry that we yeah. have Yeah, Those which kind of papers. is only at best probably 50 years old. Yeah, something like that. Uh, maybe 60 years old. Um, no, yeah, and that's and I mean that's a different. Like I said, you've got to you've got to limit that. But I, I just mean I meant the I meant the more general point, just of the committee. You know, the committee could essentially one a softer way to sell the project would be to say the committee can't even pick its percentage if you don't know how to like if we can't understand the, what the percent what the percentage is and what the factors are that lead to the percentage being what it is in a given point. And plausibly, also, of course, very plausibly, the percentage the ideal committee would pick would be way higher than 36, right? So your main points still stand, right? But it's just like, even if the committee says, look, you know, we think doing crazy shit's important sometimes, keep 20% for yourself, weird, weird science and humanities people who do, who do nonsense. Like, cool. Um, you still got to know what drives yeah. The percentage to have the value that it, that it that it does, and 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 yeah, and it seems very plausible to me that no ideal committee would say thirty six is the number. Yeah. <laughs> that that feels correct. I mean, it would be interesting to have research just about this serendipity argument, because okay, it sometimes happens, but is it really worth the cost? Because yeah, scientific yeah, research is immensely expensive, and now and again we have a we have a lucky food, but maybe it's just it's just and not there are there are many cost issues, right? So, for instance, what if you have very wrong ideas, right? Like phrenology style right. ideas. Yeah, yeah. So right. there's a cost there. there. So if you are promoting scientific racism in the nineteenth century, well, that's also on the Mm -hmm. Sciences slash humanities, so account for that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, except for me, these are generally smart people that work in academia, so all of them could have done something useful in society. Right? Solomon effect kind of worries. Yeah, it's, it's an opportunity so cost. Well you're you're yeah. just, it's, it's this sheltered workplace for the highly gifted instead of them being able to, to contribute productively. They're, they're just chatting with each other mm -hmm. from in the armchair. So that's all you, you have to if you want to make the cost benefit analysis, it can be just a benefit analysis, right? Right. Right. Uh, right. It has to be this whole thing considered cost. I was wondering, do you have any ideas about when explaining societal relevance, how you can distinguish between the 
the topic of the research and the quality of the research because I guess both are both influence societal relevance. There can be a lot of philosophy that is irrelevant because it's about obscure and strange topics, but a lot of philosophy also is just very bad philosophy, even if it is about very relevant topics such as inductive risk. Yeah. One example of a very useful topic about which there is yeah, a lot of very bad literature, so how would you incorporate that? Yeah, that's a good point. So our study is basically only the content, right? Because I guess you can't assess quality through abstracts and only. I think I think you can basically assume that most of them will say at least average quality abstracts, right? Or right. at least average. It, it is published, so in a sense, that's yeah. I was going to say that's just it's biased in one way already. But sorry, Stella. No, 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 no. That, that's a good point. Another one is that yeah, evaluating philosophy is so hard if you look at the uh, lottery of just getting something published. Um, reviewers might accept and reject and it doesn't always seem to have much to do with the quality of the paper. Um, so so I, I don't think it's doable in a scalable way to look at the, the quality of the research because there just isn't a way in philosophy except for really reading all the work and evaluating it. And even if you did that, it's so arbitrary because peer review is so arbitrary. Then I think for, for humanities it's a lost case. If you have research where you have some kind of a testable outcome, like you could replicate studies in psychology and that would give some kind of an indication of was the statistics well done, was it, was it well powered and so on. But for humanities, I'm, I can't think of, of a way of, of tracking that. I wanted to ask how could you operationalize your model? Like, um, how could you make that useful? Uh, so, could you imagine, for example, a sort of software where you get abstracts and then you can select sort of check boxes, the kind of societal relevance cues that you're looking for? So, I want something that's ethical and I want something that is present and empirical and then sort of filter. So, what I'm trying to get at is that perhaps the, 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 the device that, that you can construct can feed um, this publication machinery that academia has become in, in, in one way. So the, the most obvious use would just be to analyze the, the peer review process itself. Like if you have a committee um, evaluating grant proposals and you have all these peer reviews coming in and you could just model the whole process they're using. Like you have the reviewers, you have the committee members the biases you think might exist and then just feed everything through a model and like control for the biases and when there is when uncertainty is too weak use water or whatever. So that's uh, I think a very obvious way. The other thing you're talking about sounds like the use of AI for peer review, which is also something they're already looking into, but you would need something that can actually like understand the abstract as because I think just mm -hmm. Root text searches. Yeah, I don't see how they can really work properly. Yeah. But yeah, it's a question you have to ask Charles. <laughs> no, it's the, we don't have. Well, you already know you can't ask ChatGPT, and please don't make shit up. You know that's not yet an available button <laughs> in the model. So until we have that button, I feel like we're not going to get there. Um, yeah, this, this model had something like 1,500 parameters that in ChatGPT has like 30 billion or something. <laughs> yeah. It's wild. I'm also trying to think about so so on the kind of also on the on the kind of practical side. So so. I'm trying to think about most kind of most immediately what what could if you you know if you 
walk this to the FWAO tomorrow and we're like, here, data. Um, what would the like immediate impacts on, say, grant review, what would the best immediate impacts on grant review be? I mean, partly, I guess, maybe this, this invades some in favor of a lottery system, probably. I mean, I've, I've gone to the FWO like three weeks ago with another data set, not this one, but also one that shows there's problems with peer review. And um, obviously, I think we just shouldn't use peer review. Like, lottery or baseline funding, both fine for me. Uh, but people get very defensive. So <laughs> not, nothing will happen if you We've gone to the parliament and to the FWO, and, I think, and in love we've been trying for a very long time. So uh, nothing will happen even though the scientific evidence has been showing for a very long time already that the use of peer review doesn't make sense here. <coughs> um, yeah, it's very tricky because it is very clear that there is a problem, but people within the system get very defensive, understandably. So that's the, the bad thing. It's also understandable that they are very conservative because mm -hmm. if they make changes, they are the result of money. They know that the system they're using, at least they know what it does. Right. Um, so they will be more reluctant to change things than I would be because there are no costs for me. <coughs> but yeah, there's costs to the current system as well. And I, I think it's obvious that an organization like FWO, even if they don't want to change everything immediately, they should run experiments. There's some that do experiments, like in New Zealand and the Volkswagen Foundation and the Swiss uh, Funding for, uh, Foundation. They all have their own lottery, um, lottery experiments running. And, and I think it's obvious that the minimum is to try all their things, just to, to get some data. But yeah, peer review is, and the things I've said here aren't even the most important. I mean, right? The main problem with peer review is that it's immensely expensive. Right. People spend so much time writing grants. Typically, the professors will cost a lot. Right. And um, even if lottery would allow cranks and babblers that the peer review would stop, which is not so clear, even then it would be cheaper to just fund those cranks and babblers and then lose that 5%. It is changing, it will change slowly, but I don't think data like this will, will change anything. But it confirms that just these rater features are so important in making these evaluations that any signal you're trying to pick up about the value of the work is just trouble. Yeah, yeah. And I guess what I was I was also trying to play about play around in my head with thinking about so what changes what changes when you go from retrospective to prospective evaluation? But I guess the only, the short answer is it only gets just much worse, yeah. right? <laughs> like, because that's I mean that's not in here, right? So we're just we we're just talking about this is this is backwards evaluation in the sense that well you assume that at least somebody thought that all of these end papers were kind of okay. Yeah. Like, yeah. So grant funding is you have to predict which no one can scientific success. Yeah. So, so that's just even that's just going to compound. All of this. Yeah. Um, oof. <laughs> One thing that I still wanted to ask, as you mentioned it, but I never followed up on it, this difference between chauvinism as a bias in favor of your fields and some kind of expertise effect. Can anyone think of an empirical way of teasing these apart? So we're thinking about this, but it's I, I just don't see a way of setting up an experiment. To see what's going on there. It's on part part of it is, and I wonder if there is a way to get at this in, in survey type questions. For me, it's, it's, it feels like conceptually, it's, it's not a way of testing it empirically, but it feels like the same word but with different balance. Right? Chauvinism has a very negative balance, and expertise has a very positive balance, but they are. For me, as, as I see it, two sides of the same coin. Uh, you can you, you become chauvinistic by, by being an expert. What? Um, what? what I think that, oh, sorry. Well, can't it be that 
well, there, there is either value there or there is not. That's what we're assuming. And then so in one case, uh, the rater is overestimating the value that is there. And in another case, the other raters fail to see the value because they don't have the expertise. So go to the, go to the field eval by field eval histograms. Which ones? Uh, up, 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 wait, yeah, these, yeah, these. So, like, one thing that I thought was really interesting, right, is... We should have done this. <laughs> is that, um, so, so philosophers really hate literature, but also literature's Look at how many literatures, five other literatures. Yeah. Which is weird. And so I'm, a part of what I'm thinking, and I don't know how you get at this, maybe there's a way to get at this in a survey question, is right, I can also imagine that if I'm, so if I'm looking at an abstract, there are two ways that I might decide to give it a zero. I can decide to give it a zero because it's like, look, the problem, even if you did like banger research on this question, this problem is just, you know, this problem is not societally relevant, right? And that's the sense that you guys wanted, wanted people to use to evaluate, right? So, like, imagine that this is like God did the research, so you know it's awesome. Um, it's still not relevant, sorry. But when I see that, like, that, like, five literature thing there, part of me wonders if part of what's happening here is of, like, This become like I don't even know how to phrase this. Like anything on this question would suck, whether or not it's societally relevant, whether or not it's, it's just because this is like a garbage part of our field, and therefore any work that occurs. So you're almost even though you were trying to screen off quality, you're making a kind of concealed quality evaluation. So like maybe here I'll you know it's not like this is live on the internet. Or you know, like, maybe I'm going to five any philosophy paper about Derrida. Just because I'm like, look, I don't even care if you think it has societal relevance. It's not going to because it sucks. Right? And so I'm making some kind of, like, masked quality judgment. And so I'm trying to think about how could you kind of screen off those, like, masked quality assessments in this kind of context. And maybe... Maybe if you give people, you know, you give people a hundred abstracts, but you don't tell them that they were published, and you start by trying to get people to just do a scientific quality assessment, and you take the top band, and then you say, okay, you thought all of these were good. Which ones are society? Now do the societally relevant. Uh, I mean, you would, because the effect you're talking about, it goes in both directions, right? Right. Like, maybe there's some part of your field that you think is so awesome that any paper from that field you'll give a high score. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah, like, I mean, now I can, I can more easily come up with examples like that in the sciences, but like, you know, so you could think that like, look, you know, whatever, uh, biodiversity loss is so important that all ecology papers are like intrinsically societally relevant right now because we desperately need to know a whole lot more about everything pursuant to ecology. So it just doesn't matter. They're all they're all great. Um, yeah, no, you're right. You're right, and that would only so that would screen off the negative, but it would leave you with an overinflated with an overinflated top end. But yeah, no, it's a good. Maybe we can just ask explicitly, right? Like for each abstract, just indicate whether you think the quality is high or something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, maybe by making uh, like made up abstracts where you know, for example, the quality is really bad, but that the purpose itself as being society <coughs> relevant, so you make up one of those abstract like those trials. Yeah, like, a, like a vignette study, basically. Something yeah, like that, where you like made up words from, you know, if, if you know they are uh, philosophical. Literature, you make uh, something from philosophy that sounds really relevant, but it's just 
made up words and concepts, and then maybe you filter out, maybe precisely not your question, but you filter out um, people who are assessing economic skill the way around. You're filtering out not knowledge of, of that field, but um, they might still think it's absolutely relevant, so you're not picking up on, 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 on choppiness. But yeah, but for people within the field, you could filter things out. Yes. Yeah. I don't know if, if, if you playing along with, with uh, the abstracts and making some vignettes, uh, you could get to, to filtering out uh, certain aspects. Yeah. The downside of vignette study is that you always divide your population by the number of versions you have. So then you need a, a much bigger um, population to, to get the same kind of data. So um, I forgot the number. One means that it's really good and five is really bad or the other one? Five bad. Five bad. bad. No, so literature people that, okay, they, they don't like it themselves. Not so much, no. But, um, but they are very constant towards the rest. Whereas um, historians are full of themselves. Uh, but otherwise very ecumenical. Yes. <laughs> One thing that's also relevant mentioning is that for literature we only had two raters, and for the other fields we had a few more, so maybe there's more. Maybe it's just a slight bias sampling yeah. effect. But still. But yeah, still it's, it's interesting that they are so not chauvinistic. Your religion is also extremely weird, right? Like super, they're like they're like super zen. They like that. They, 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 I look at that and I'm like, the religion people are very objective. <laughs> it's just it's so flat. They hate linguistics, no, though. No, that, oh yeah, that, 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 true, true. <coughs> there was the change and history to sort of extend right? right here, but if you see the uh, the switch. So for religion, you can see there was actually one rate that there was. Very negatively chauvinistic, and one ah, was very chauvinistic. So they just they, the two raiders canceled each other out. Yeah. One guy really, one guy was super harsh against the other religion projects, and the other guy was yeah. not. Yeah. Got it. it, got it. That checks out. Oh, that's it's funny. How how did your uh, recruitment uh, process look like? We sent emails to all the departments at KU Leuven. Um, we didn't go through supervisors because we didn't want to put any pressure. I want to make sure we didn't put pressure on PhD students to participate. We just sent the email saying this is how much we pay, this is how much work it is, this is the deadline, and then mm -hmm. people and signed up. And why did you target PhD students again? I forgot. So we wanted people that were experts because they had to be well informed. Mm -hmm. um, there is no way we can get professors to do this. There's probably no way we can get postdocs to do this. And among PhDs, definitely at the arts faculty in Leuven, there's quite a few unfunded ones who always are looking for like easy, easy jobs on the site. So okay. just practically, I mean, it was it was yeah, easy to sure find them and to pay them, but I don't think Leander will ever want to do it again. <coughs> but we basically took any PhDs we could get. Okay. It was really difficult to find these 16. Now we did a we did a pilot with four philosophers as well. But I think if we try to replicate it, we would go through some kind of online platform. Mm -hmm. And that was it. Yeah, yeah. I just don't know how to disentangle these. It's not so important in a sense. All you need to know is that they're different. Yeah. I mean, if you're thinking about improving the, the evaluation process, it's not so important what the causes or in what direction they're biased. True. But it's conceptually interesting. Yeah. Well, I guess, I don't know. I guess the other, it, I mean, I don't think this is the right approach, but one way to really dig in your heels here would be to say, you know,
the effect is just dominated by uh, uh, essentially not knowing what you're talking about, right? And so you could, you could, I mean, that's part of what I think, I guess, makes this difficult from a policy perspective, right? You actually could look at most, not all, because there's still gonna be, there's still problems, obviously, but you could look at a lot of this data and your response could just be to retrench, basically, right? And say that, like, yeah, exactly, you see what this shows? Like, the only people who understand how to evaluate literature papers are literature people, mm -hmm. right? So we need small peer review panels of our people to review our grants. But then the fact of such heterogeneity with, within the field yeah. as to chauvinism is a major problem, right? Then you still, I mean, you still, you still have that problem. Um, and I suspect, right, I suspect that be cool to disentangle them because I suspect that if you could, the disentanglement would also speak against that. Right? I suspect mm -hmm. that it wouldn't just be that. Mm -hmm. It's about knowing more about the field. Yeah. Um, so that's why I, mean, I think it would be cool in that sense. Disentangling the causality would be cool because it would also help you kind of stop fight against that, re that retrenchment move. It's true. Um, but I'll be damned if I have any idea how. Yeah, there is. <laughs> can probably make a very simple argument for that based on the data, right? So I guess that given there is so much chauvinism for one of the religion rapers and so little for the other, or yeah, it's negative for the other, I guess one of them has a lot of ones, the other has a, the other doesn't, and just then take some kind of Bruneui model, say, well, there is no way that they could have, if they really had the same view of things, if they were the same, the same idea about these things, it would be very weird that they would have that. Yeah, but there's differences in expertise even within the field and maybe yeah. the religion. Like, sure, but then, always do this then it's always that's, yeah, that's part of the problem. Then, then it seems so, it seems very contrived, right? Right. And in the following sense, well, the panel should, should have the exact right people that make the right the right judgments for these specific uh, uh, proposals, that's just an impossible ask. Yeah, it's also, if you look at the abstracts, because we read all of them, then for many of them, there isn't that much background knowledge that is necessary to know whether it's societally relevant or not. Take the one that got the lowest score, okay, I don't know those texts, but if even I don't know them, then I know that almost no one will know them, and mm -hmm. it's extremely unlikely it's going to be very relevant. So. I think the easier explanation is just these are people that are doing a PhD in that topic that clearly are interested in it, that if like committed to spending their life like that, well, probably they're going to find it more than average important. Mm -hmm. and I, mean, I think that's just the, the, the easier, exp simple explanation. Mm -hmm. and, and could it also help explain the fact that we all have so many this idea of what societal relevance is? Uh, that's why when we see this uh, uh, literature text and these two obscure religious texts that, that we already very intuitively say okay, it's not societally relevant um, and so I don't know how you could code in the fact that they are different um, or try to get the information of what a societal relevance is for specific people um, because then we, we might see the kind of um. Yeah, that's actually a thing I consider to have varying parameters for all the causal factors, for all the raters. Sort of to see, maybe there's like one rater that always gives the morality a one, and one rater that always gives it one. Because I, I bet there's big differences there as well. Yeah, because what for a historian is socially relevant might not be for a philosopher, or, or the other way around. And, and, uh, but so we, we didn't ask them to say what they think is societally relevant. We asked them, like, just imagine this process yeah, yeah. wouldn't be chosen. So we, we didn't ask them, do you think this is important? Okay. And we, we really tried to emphasize to them not to judge it like that. Of course, they did in the end, because there are massive differences. So, so just to, to understand more clearly, your data shows that peer review is not effective 
and picking out socially relevant research? Well, it shows that whatever differences the model says there are in societal relevance are just washed out by differences in later features. So there are probably differences in societal relevance, but they are so small that the process cannot capture that signal because the, the process is, has, these, has these biases in it. So the only way to do it then with such a process is to have a, a good model of the process and to use that model to tease out how various things play a role. Max's question, I guess, is something that I wanted to ask. You know, when you were doing your like your like Raider instruction, could you tell like I know this is an impossible question to answer, but still, like, could you tell whether they were kind of taking seriously the idea that they were supposed to be doing this kind of weird evaluation view from nowhere thing? Yeah, so there were some who clearly got it, uh, but there were also a few uh, for whom I really wasn't sure they actually <laughs> understood it completely. Also, the emails they sent afterwards, it was, it was not so clear, but yeah, we had, we had certain criteria to include them also pre-registered, so we, we can't just like, exclude their data. But sure, sure. So definitely there were some raters that I don't think really got the whole teacher scheme. We really tried to explain it um, and really tried to emphasize, but I think definitely after eight hours of rating, Ah, because right. I wanted to ask how many, how many did they have to read individually? Uh, 345. Oh, yeah. Each. I mean, I can understand after like, so they, tiredness. They took drive around to eight go. hours. We gave them a couple of weeks to do it. So it didn't have to be in one go. But, but this is very common from, from experiments with people, right? That after a while, people will just default to whatever is energetically easier. <laughs> <laughs> And then many of the instruments are energetically easier than, than yeah. trying to really stand out from, from like this view from nowhere. Yeah, we also tracked the time they spent and ah, you, you that could. varied very strongly between raters. Like some clearly okay. do it very seriously. Some you excluded them anyone in the end? <coughs> we only excluded raters if they had uh, if they had a couple of blocks that were too short to actually read the abstracts. Uh, that was never the case, mm -hmm. so we think that at least they read it, but we right. did exclude one rater because he had like eight uh, blocks with inconsistent inconsistencies between the ranking and the binary. Oh, he ignored the, ignored the, 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 constraint. the yeah, the constraint, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And we, yeah. we thought it, I mean, we had pre-registered that, that we just think it means that they are not really paying attention. Right, right. Uh, so so you could, you could check for that. Yeah, we could check that as well. Yeah, that's that's good. So, so having having the time and having the constraint, that does mean you have to not be completely asleep while yeah, you're clicking the exactly. buttons. Yeah, good. No, that's really important. That's nice. I know it's a big problem with like to think very hard if you're ever going to do mechanical Turk studies yeah, or whatever. Because exactly. yeah, you've got to come up with some strong criteria for like how am I sure that someone actually used like more than one brain cell to yeah. complete my study. Good. No, that's good. Okay. Thank what are you uh, What are you planning to do with it? Are you gonna uh, where, where are you Where are you gonna Where are you gonna write it up and send it? Yeah, I'm not really sure yet. So I'm, I'm still considering whether we should try to replicate with other raters as well. Sure. Uh, also, we did pre-register, but we didn't pre-register this exact model. Like, I hadn't figured out a good way of getting the ordinal and the binary data into one model. Sure. So the results are the same for the models that we pre-registered. So it's exactly the same ranking and so on, but I think this model is a lot neater, so it would be nice to pre-register this and now replicate it. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Then have a really tight... Um, but, yeah, but then, yeah, it sounds like the logistics for this were kind of shitty. Yeah, it <laughs> <laughs> was mostly Leander. <laughs> it's, uh, it's still Leander entirely Leander. resolved. One, one rater. Sure, yeah. yeah, we had to pay them through Kaylor and it was just amazing. Uh, 
uh, and give it to their staff that makes it extra difficult. Oh, yeah, right. Right. Yeah, you can't just like put an Amazon gift card in an unmarked envelope and no. pretend like pretend like we're all good. Yeah. <laughs> So it would be fun to do the study in you live, right? <laughs> <laughs> I uh, actually, based on my experience of what it took to get me to pay three students to be like chat moderators during an online conference during COVID, it would be no easier than it is. No, because they could just uh, fill out our F1 form and they could just say. Oh, I could. Right, so when we do it, I need to hire your people, and when yeah. you do it, you can hire our people, and then we're good to go. Because then it's the external reimbursement form, and it's easy. Uh, yeah, that's the plan. Really? Big brain yeah, plays. my plan now, because... Big brain plays. <laughs> because all of you researchers are at Google. Uh, okay, so maybe you just need to for one of the universities. Yeah, yeah. You need a contact that, uh, whatever. During my days of despair, I had a lot of time to think about this stuff. <laughs> In between the weeping. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, for another study, there was an online survey. We, we promised to donate for every uh, participant one euro to a, to a charity. And it was also more <laughs> miserable for me to get it paid. Like, you can. You can buy so many things with university money, but giving money to charity is nearly impossible. <laughs> sure. Like, what do you mean? You're not, you're not buying anything? You're like, no, we're just giving... What? What do you get for it? Well, nothing. It's a charity. It's so sweet. <laughs> Very cool. All right. Well, yeah. Thanks so much.